Hello everyone, thank you for clicking on the Literacy Volunteers of Harrison County YouTube channel. We're a nonprofit United Way agency and we provide these videos to you for educational purposes. We would love for you to view them, to share them, to like them, and please subscribe to our channel. Just click the bell icon below and you'll be notified every time we put up a new video. Today I'm continuing on with my Biology 101 series. This is lesson number five on the history of DNA. We're going to do a few lessons, maybe three on DNA. This will be the first one and we're going to look at how DNA was discovered to be the um, messenger for hereditary material. So here's the early work. If you go clear back to 1869, this guy named Meischer, Friedrich Meischer, he isolates a substance from the nucleus of cells and he calls it nuclein, but his student Richard Altman calls it nucleic acid. So now that we know that there's a substance in the nucleus that's been labeled nucleic acid because it has an acid group on it and because it was found in the nucleus. Um, later on, biochemists will identify that there are two different types of nucleic acids. We have both DNA and RNA. So several years later, in 1929, um, Levine at the Rockefeller Center identifies the four bases of DNA. And we're going to look at those a little bit at the end, but next time we're going to do a video on the structure of DNA. And we'll look at those uh, more closely at that time um, because that goes along more with that lesson. So what does DNA do? Okay, um, researchers in the early times, maybe in the early 1920s, they knew that DNA was found in chromosomes. Um, chromosomes are discrete packaging units of DNA in your cells. We have 23 pair of chromosomes, but different animals, different species. If a banana has more chromosomes or less chromosomes than a strawberry, they're different amounts. But that's where DNA is. But they didn't think that it was the hereditary material. They knew that it existed, but they didn't think that it carried your genetic code. They thought that proteins carried your genetic code because like I've said before 99% of the time in biology when you're dealing on something with the molecular level it's a protein proteins usually govern almost everything um, so some researchers including Linus Pauling thought that the protein also found in chromosomes was probably the hereditary factor chromosomes aren't all DNA it's DNA tightly coiled but they wrap around proteins called histones and the way that those are looser or, or tighter around the histone proteins are the DNA that gets read and we'll talk about that I can do a video on epigenetics and we'll talk about that later so how um, can the hereditary factor be determined the only way we can determine things through science is through experimentation right we have to do we have to have a hypothesis we have to perform experiment collect data and then we can accept or reject our hypothesis so right now we're going by the hypothesis that proteins carry the genetic code all right, so the first guy that we have is named Frederick Griffith, and he has a famous experiment. And in 1928, he carried out these experiments on pneumonia bacteria, or the bacteria that caused pneumonia in mice, or even in people. But he did the experiments with mice. A lot of these early experiments were done on mice because it kind of gives us an idea of how it would act in a human. So what he did was he had these bacterial colonies that caused pneumonia. There were two types of col um, colonies. There was the rough colony, that's this one, and they were non-virulent. Virulent means disease causing. So these were non-virulent, they didn't cause disease, and this was called the R strain for rough. That's what their coats look like. Bacteria have protein coats on them um, to help, and then some of them produce polysaccharides, sugars, and, and different things for your body to take them up. When you sneeze or something like that, you know, those are kind of a bacterial coats. So then he also had a smooth strain, which was virulent. It caused disease that had the smooth outer coats, if you look on these, bacterium. So he takes the mice and he injects them with these bacterium. There's his little needle, right? So the first one, we inject this mouse with our non-virulent strain. And then that mouse is healthy. It lives. So we know that it's the non-virulent strain. It didn't cause a disease. Then he takes the smooth virulent strain and injects the mouse and the mouse dies. So we know that's disease causing. So we have to figure out what part of this bacterium is disease causing. So he goes and he heat kills the smooth bacteria. See how this one has an outer coat, but these do not? If we subject these to heat, that's why you wash your hands with hot water to kill the bacteria, we kill this outer coat, right? It's heat killed. So he then takes the bacteria and injects it into this mouse, and the mouse is still healthy. 
So we're wondering why now, if we've gotten rid of the, um, the coat on the bacteria, is the mouse still healthy even though we're injecting it with the virulent strain? So let's do two things. We're going to think about that and we're going to um, use them together. So lastly, he takes that rough non-virulent strain and this heat killed strain and injects it into the mouse. This time the mouse dies. So why did that happen? So he takes blood from the mice and they look at it and they say in this live strain from this mouse, in his blood sample, um, they had the live strain, this one, in the blood sample from the dead mouse. But how did it get there? So we know it wasn't in the protein coat because the protein coat is gone, right? So it has to be carried within the genetic material inside the cell. This is a process called transformation. So he was the first person to get into that. So here's his um, ultimate discovery. Something in those heat killed bacteria, the virulent ones, were transferred, that's where we get transformation, to those live harmless bacteria to make them virulent, to make them kill that mouse. So moving on, we have Oswald Avery, and he kind of expounded upon Griffith's um, experiments, and he um, looked at those findings to discover what factor in those bacteria carried the trait. And that's what we're looking for, what carries the traits. So he isolated proteins, carbohydrates, and nucleic acids, and he put those in non-virulent bacteria. Only the nucleic acids caused a change. So now we know that that's where that's being carried. And so we go to the next um, set of experiments, which is the Hershey-Chase experiment. And this is a very famous one as well. Hershey and Chase studied what are called bacteriophages, right? They're, they are uh, viruses with bacteria in them, bacteria that attack bacteria, viruses that attack bacteria. Um, and so they knew that the phages attached to the surface. Here's our bacteria, and it's going to attach to the surface of that cell, right? And inject it with either the DNA or the protein into this host cell. But now they have to know which substance gave the instructions. So they radioactively label um, the, they, these protein coats, and um, they radioactively label the DNA. So in this one we have 32 phosphorus labeled DNA. That's the green stuff. And this is the protein coat. Um, viruses have protein coats on them as well. And then this is the 35 sulfur, and in here we're going to label the protein. We're going to label the coat. So we have to figure out what's carrying them. So he lets the bacteriophages infect the cells. Here are our bacteria cells, and put their um, DNA down into the cell, which is what they do, um, and into the into the host cell. And then he put those in a centrifuge and spun them up, and we get and um, we spin them out. And in the 32, he found inside the cells. Inside the bacteria, he found the radioactively labeled. And then when he spun this one out, on the, it was on the outside of the cell. So now we know that this DNA that was labeled is carried straight into the, this cell, but the protein coat isn't. It's sloughed off and the DNA is floating out here. So that's another experiment that further lets us know that DNA carries the genetic code. The conclusion was, when they measured the radioactivity I showed you in the pellet and the supernatant, that's just the whatever we spun it from, from both of their experiments they found that the large amount of the 32 phosphorus appeared in the pellet and whereas all of the um, sulfur appeared in the liquid outside of the pellet. So based on this and other experiments they performed, they concluded that DNA, not protein, was injected into host cells and made up the genetic material of the phage. So now we've figured out that DNA carries our genetic code. What I've done here for you is to show you a representation, very diagrammatic representation, of DNA. DNA stands for, in case you don't know, deoxyribonucleic acid. D mean without, we've taken off an oxygen, and it's um, a ribonucleic, meaning we found it in the nucleus, acid. It's a double helix structure. We're going to look at that more, how they discovered that in the next. And you've probably heard of Watson and Crick. We'll talk about them. And here are the four bases that I spoke of before. We have adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. Those are the only four bases that appear in DNA. That's it. 
And so well, adenine always binds with thymine and guanine always binds with cytosine. And here you can see the hydrogen bonds that hold them together. We will discuss next time um, what happens, how we replicate DNA and we make new DNA. So when your parents give you, your dad gives you half of his and your mom gives you half of hers and you become you, we can see how that happens. And we'll talk about more about how they discovered the structure of DNA. So we would like to thank you for clicking on our videos and please give us a thumbs up and share this with your friends.